Mr. David Grimes is uh, Assistant Deputy Minister and Head of Environment Canada Meteorological Service since July 2006. He has been the Canada's permanent, permanent representative with WMO since uh, 2006 and he's been the uh, president of WMO since 2011, being, just being elected for another term of four years. It's a great pleasure to have you here, David. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and it's a pleasure, uh, pleasure to be here. I've, um, um, I was actually asked to give a, a, a bit more of a story about Canada, but you know, as the uh, president of the World Meteorological Organization, you're a little tempted to sort of throw in a few tidbits from, uh, from around the world. I found, you know, it's interesting, the, the two previous speakers, the first one talking about technology and the role of technology and how that can be used in innovation can actually be used in the context of, uh, of uh, reducing demand. And on that point, you know, being, being, having visited many parts of the world since, uh, well, maybe in the last decade, you can see that um, even the cost of um, the, the, not everyone is the same. Not everyone is in the same kind of state. And so uh, I'll give you an example. In Canada, I was up in the, in the Canadian Arctic. I go up at least once a year. And in that, uh, and, and I look at um, infrastructure built up there. And the cost of replacing the infrastructure, even with really good innovative kind of technology, still very expensive. And you have to find the investors to be able to underwrite that. You go to a place such as, um, and I was recently in Cabo Verde, which is an island off the West African coast, it's a state, a series of islands. And when, when you look at, you know, the, the, it was a least developed country until just recently. Least developed country, which means they don't have the facility to be able to implement what we often look at in the context of how we see ourselves in our own country or how we live. And I come from Canada, just like the United States. It's a rather well-developed economy, very well-developed middle class. There's, um, the economy is uh, very much dictated on uh, a consumption or a service-based economy. These, these are elements that you don't see in the developing world. What you see is they don't have access. They don't have access to power grids. So in the international, um, in the international context, the ARENA, which is a, uh, in a UN, it's not a UN, officially UN specialized agency, but it's, a, it's on its way to become a UN agency. And the Secretary General of the United Nations just uh, um, last year announced you know, energy for all, because when you go to Africa, you don't actually see the lights on. And, and so when you think of how you power an economy, how you improve quality of life, you have to think about that in the context of things that we, we know, because you turn a light switch on when you come to the hotel, or you come to a place in other parts of the world, that just doesn't exist. So in that, uh, in that particular context, I wanted to leave you some key messages because I'm supposed to bring the meteorology side of this, not so much the energy side. But um, I've got four key messages. The first is that meteorology and energy are highly coupled. Public policy is influencing our energy choices. So whether it's COP, whether it's the COP21, and the France, you know, in, in Paris and whatever the outcome of that is. Um, what's clear is that the choices are being influenced very much around the world by public policy, which means for the developing world, getting access to that technology that will allow them to actually embrace some of the messages you heard earlier this morning. Third message, Energy supply and demand are becoming increasingly influenced by changing weather and climate patterns. 
both in terms of supply and demand. And my last point is recent meteorological science and technology advancements offer improved services for the energy sector. So those are kind of my four key messages. So the first is, you know, when, when you look as a meteorologist and you look at predictability, you, you quickly start to realize that just looking at the atmosphere and the atmosphere on its own, although it's an energy form in itself, is insufficient. And it's actually have to look at the energy fluxes that actually occur in the whole Earth system. And our improvements in uh, predictability have come with our ability to understand the ocean dynamics and couple that with the atmosphere. So you start to see this kind of advanced skill. So the atmosphere itself, or meteorology, is actually a study of, uh, of energy and energy exchange. In terms of Canada, and just to kind of put this into perspective, it's a pretty big country. Population is a tenth of the United States. We have significant water and biomass resources. Electricity generation is primarily hydro. So we have a target to be, of our electricity production, to be 90% uh, over the course of the next decade, 90% clean. And we're, our hydro resources represent at least three quarters of that in terms of, um, of our uh, clean, clean energy. Uh, we have significant potential for renewables. However, all that little yellow bit tells you where the population is. We have challenges in transporting energy to market. So if you want to look in central, in central Quebec, which is for those um, in this, for those who don't know, that's central Quebec. There's a huge, it's called the Battery of North America, huge hydro facility there that provides electricity not only for the eastern part of Canada, but for a good part of the U.S. Northeast in terms of um, providing uh, we have a unified North American grid for electricity, and so we have sort of a harmonized uh, pricing between uh, Canada, the United States, and the electricity market. But it is a long way to transport, and a lot of the weather-related problems they have is with the transmission of electricity. The energy market is uh, very sensitive to the price point. I'll just give you uh, an example about 15 years ago, I was with the Consortium of Energy Producers in, Can in Canada, and I talked about renewables at that time and the support that meteorological infrastructure could provide in supporting renewables, but you couldn't compete with the cost of producing hydroelectric power. So the cost was down at around five and a half cents per kilowatt, water, uh, kilowatt uh, hour, and that um, this was, um, I mean, renewables at the time required public policy to actually um, subsidize. And they do in Canada, we do subsidize that. And that, I think, in the context of the previous speaker's discussion, is becoming more and more palatable as we move to understanding sort of pricing carbon. So province of Quebec and Ontario have, uh, with California, have formed this consortium of carbon pricing, which will kind of change the dynamics for renewables in Canada, certainly since those two parts of the country represent about 70% of the, of the population of the country. So what's shaping our energy futures? Well, where we live, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy systems for all. Particularly true when you go to a place like some parts of Africa. When you look at uh, geopolitical instability, it happens in different places. So they put in a lot of infrastructure. One of the issues that was discussed at the World Meteorological Congress was this um, areas under strife, under conflict, or under occupation. And these, these are challenges with respect to built infrastructure, power facilities, etc. So in this particular context, these sort of have an impact on where investors will spend money. Uh, how we live, and I think that population intensification issue that Claude uh, mentioned earlier is a very important factor 
in understanding that. And often it's uh, not supplied just by kind of local sources. You usually have to transport to uh, local sources. There's also in the context of uh, demand for uh, resources and water supply. And in some parts of the world where we've seen decreases in precipitation, decreases in glaciers that provide the water supply for all these communities, this is kind of a meteorological phenomena. What you're seeing is desalination plants, they take huge amount of energy resources to function, just to give you drinking water. So weather and climate risks are changing. So we're seeing more and more uh, episodes of extreme events. This is having, um, this is having a particular set of context. I'll give you um, a couple of examples on how that impacts on the energy market. So um, uh, just recently in, uh, in Canada, it happened at Christmas time, we had a huge ice storm in the city of Toronto and surrounding areas. Population is about 6 million, so represents about 20% of the Canadian population, a little under 20%. And uh, they had no power for two weeks partly because of the infrastructure, the transmission lines, all basically had uh, collapsed. And so restoring that. We had another event in 1998, took out the city of Montreal, which is another big, big population center. Again, they also had uh, disruption in power. This was all caused by freezing rain. And when you're in a, in a transition zone in, uh, in North America, in particularly the southern part of Canada, we see more and more freezing rain events. And the structures, so Claude mentioned about the, the hurricane, um, hurricane force winds that blow down um, um, wind turbines, uh, you also have transmission lines that just can't take the weight and the stress and they collapse. And they take human power actually to restore these things and it takes time. So this idea of working with the, um, with the energy sector on how they can compensate by increasing, for example, the heat on those lines is one way of um, managing those, those kind of high risks. So, there's, um, so they're looking, so we work with them in finding other, uh, other opportunities. So in terms of, um, I think the, the key point on this slide is that we have to be cognizant of the impl impl implications of the changing context. And in particular, you know, what, what we're seeing is, and the IPCC report just came out, highlighted this kind of, we not only have a warming atmosphere, but we have a warming ocean. And this, this has huge implications because the warming ocean holds a lot of heat. And when eventually, those heat, that heat's going to get returned in, in, into the atmosphere. So this creates a very long-term problem for, uh, for us in the context of understanding this kind of extreme, noisy kind of climate variability that we're likely to exper experience in, as a result of this kind of changing, uh, changing climate. So this is going to result in increased frequency and magnitude of weather and climate related extreme events. And these changing weather and climate patterns impact societal demands for energy, as well as its production and transmission. 2003, 15,000 people died in France. 2009, we had almost the same in Russia, caused by heat waves. Because the infrastructure in, in those communities were not built to deal with that heat. In Canada, you know, we used to be, everyone thinks about Canada as a cold nation. And it turned out as a cold nation that you would expect that our, uh, for buildings, we would consume more electricity or more, let's say, energy to heat our houses. But actually, when you look at the trends, we have as much, we, we're spending almost as much in cooling our buildings now. This is a trend, this is about climate, this is a change where we're starting to see not only do we have, and we've had 
some very cool winter solstice in the northeastern United States just recently. Uh, also as a consequence of some changing weather in the polar regions that, that are having particular implication. And as, as a, uh, so as a consequence, we're getting sort of increased demands when you get these extreme events between a long period of heat and a long period of cold. So even though we find that we might use energy more efficiently, we still will have these episodes of these kind of uh, extreme events. So when you go to parts of the world where their water resources are drying up and their dependency is on glacier-fed mountain streams, uh, and you, when you go and you look at some of these, you see that they're disappearing. Um, they have to find alternative sources. And usually, that's tra either transporting water, which is expensive. I don't know if everyone to just take a bucket of water, pick it up and carry it to the end and do that about 50 times. I think you'd be tired unless you're really, really fit. But that's, that's energy. I'm using energy by lifting and going back and forth. Well, when we use energy, transport water, or to desalinate, these are going to be increased costs. This is a consequence of having these kind of dry periods, or very prolonged dry periods. In Australia, they had a 12-year drought. They went and made a commitment. They did some great technology in Australia in terms of how to manage the, um, manage the um, regime in terms of uh, being a very efficient. When I'm in Australia, I'm very pleased with how, or impressed with how they, they manage their water resources. Um, but they built desalination plants because they had no choice. And these will, so new forms, new demands for energy will increase as a consequence of these kind of changes. And how we improve our predictability, and this I'm going to come to next, as I think, is through this kind of seamless prediction. So most of the time, you know, we, we talked about weather forecasts in, in the context of, you know, a week or so. We provide some signal checks on seasonal outlooks. Um, and we started this kind of for mostly, I think, as a con context in 1988 when we established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was this idea of trying to understand what's going on with our climate system, looking at these large-scale global climate models. And then there's about 40 of them or so around the world right now that are used to sort of support our understanding of what's, what is taking, what, what, what is happening in those kind of sort of uh, decades and centuries. But the reality is that um, uh, in between, we have, uh, uh, and this was brought up in the context of our discussion on climate services, that you can see all the areas that are highlighted there in orange, little orange box, all, all sort of implicated implications for the energy sector. These are climate services where we're looking now in the period of days, even through to a year into a decade, are important. So the World Meteorological Organization has a program, sub seasonal to subseasonal, which is an initiative to better understand the, our predictability of that time frame. We also have a, a strong initiative of the World Climate Research Program that's related to trying to understand the focus in the decades now not so much out to the, what's going to happen 100 years from now, but what's happening 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And so there's a strong initiative focus there. And there's, uh, within that sub-seasonal seasonal work is looking at how we can improve information that's necessary to support, not just the energy sector, but it would support the energy sector in, the, in this context of sort of uh, weeks. We're in these periods of weeks and sort of how to support that. So um, the world's kind of organized around how to, how to improve our science in this capacity. Technology has helped us through advancing, mostly through computational capacity, allow us to be able to run these kind of, uh, these kind of models. 
So there's very strong uh, collaboration between the sectors. But you also have to recognize that not everyone is the same. I've covered this point before. But resource endowments are different as well. So in Canada, we're very fortunate. We have, we have lots of everything, actually, in terms of energy resources, partly because we have a lot of water. We have a lot of wind. We have not so much solar in the wintertime. But in parts of the southern part of the country, we have solar. But these, these are providing kind of these benefits. But other parts of the world, they don't have the same. So it's not universally applied. And therefore, you need to develop your information that makes it unique to the decision making and unique to the circumstance that we're serving. In the international context, I mentioned IRENA, which is this International Renewable Energy Agency, and might expect they probably on their way to become a UN agency um, over the next uh, several years. They're kind of working in that direction. We have an agreement with them in the World Meteorological Organization, primarily to support this uh, initiative in uh, primarily in Africa, which is bringing renewable energy to Africa. Um, but to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, the interesting thing that you learn from the telephone technology is when you're in, uh, you're in an old city, whether you're in Canada or in the United States, you probably see a lot of telephone poles and wires. And when you go to some of these, in the developing world, you don't see any of that. So they've already leapfrogged that technology. So the advantage of coming late and then recognizing that Certainly, uh, fast uh, these, this kind of fast start funding that was made available prior to the Green Fund, and the Green Fund will provide some opportunity for this kind of fast tracking or leapfrogging into some of this new newer technologies. We've um, our partnership is focused mostly on the science and technology and how we're kind of supporting supporting their uh, their program objectives. IRENA itself has good outreach into the, what I might call that kind of pseudo public and private sector enterprises in the energy, in the energy sector. And finally, um, I'll just touch on the global framework for climate services because it's a, um, uh, this is an initiative that started at the Third World Climate Conference that began in 2009. And it was recognized that for adaptation to climate change, because even if we were to miraculously turn off all the switch, I think everyone knows the story that we have at least a decade, at least a century of significant changes that as a consequence of, of decisions that we took over the last hundred years. So in this particular context, when we had, and it was attended by many heads of state, similar to the Sendai Conference, which was uh, held in Japan, where they lacked access to information that allowed them to, to be able to make smart decisions, climate smart decisions. And um, we, have, uh, we had that in four priority areas of water, health, food security, and disaster sort of uh, catastrophe mitigation, I guess you could, disaster risk reduction, people use different names. But at the time there was still this, this particular focus on energy and we approved in the last Congress this emphasis of developing, um, developing climate services in direct response to support energy. And I look forward actually over the next um, four year cycle to see how much work we can do to actually improve the science and technology and the services that we could provide to help, you know, um, uh, motivate, I guess, uh, smart decision making within the energy sector. And this is actually good because what you end up doing in these types of initiatives is you focus your energy on a set of requirements the energy sector sets for itself, as we did for food security and as we've done for water resource management. And for us, this, uh, this is actually quite important as energy underpins actually the success of those four, those four other priority areas. Without energy, it's very hard to actually 
uh, ensure that you have, you know, safe drinking water for every, uh, every citizen in the world. So um, um, the, other, um, uh, the other aspect, and that was kind of what I meant by that fit for purpose, is um, was raised by uh, Claude and her, her comments about risk and this risk dimension and then what is the response and adaptation. So then in that particular, in that particular context, it's, uh, it, 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 it's important then to see how you develop the, the thresholds that decision makers have. So the difficulty that we had was that as a provider of scientific information or meteorology, we can put it all, broadcast it all out there for you. But unless I really know how you're going to use it and where your points of threshold, your thresholds are, and so does it matter or doesn't matter? Unless you actually develop that interface effectively, it doesn't really, you're not sure that you're actually spending your energy in the right way. So as a consequence, this is actually building these interfaces between the energy community through understanding where their risk tolerances are at local and regional levels and the science that is accessible worldwide. So what we've done through the World Meteorological Organization is we put a big fence around the world's knowledge resources and we just passed very difficult uh, policy in the World Meteorological Congress which had to do with data sharing. With data sharing on climate because it's actually um, if, you if you think about it, um, it has uh, its own economic value in the sense that it could be easily sold or uh, to, and the idea of making it more in this public good, open, open environment will actually be a much better benefit to the world than it would be if it was confined. So just a couple last little slides. Just to let you know what we're doing in Canada. So um, we operate uh, global models and we operate a two and a half kilometer model over, over most of North America and the, over the Arctic Basin. So it's, uh, we've just introduced that. It's uh, similar to what um, NOAA in the US has just sort of introduced as well. We have an, an, we have an, an agreement with NOAA where we combine our products and make them into an ensemble, uh, ensemble products, which actually shows, um, let's say what the error distribution is in any given circumstance. It allows the user to make more intelligent choices with their data and how it can be applied. So, uh, and we're now, um, in, we, we did this, uh, we tested this when we did the Winter Olympics in Vancouver in 2010. And we're doing it for the Pan American Games, which will be held in Toronto very shortly. In this a kind of urban scale modeling uh, initiative, which is operating at 250 meters. Um, and is showing some very uh, promising results. When you get down to that scale, you can start to see how that could benefit both, both you know, the energy sector. And in Canada, our energy sector is as much water as it is uh, wind in, in the context. So we manage the sort of responsible for the hydrology in Canada, and we, we for the Canadian government at least, and we manage the, um, um, at that scale, we can start to see where we can, the science can actually make a difference, provide more confidence. So uh, this kind of gives you that scope of scale. We operate models at all, these, uh, at all these levels between sort of right down into very short term all the way out to century products, which we're actually putting on a unified frame. So we use the same model except for the global one, but the regional one actually operates on the same platform. So every time we make a change in the model physics or, the, or improve a model, it also improves our regional one as it does the one that will give you a forecast in the next 30 minutes. We also work with um, the uh, renewable energy associations. So we have a very strong, we're part of their process. 
uh, we developed for Canada, which actually we gave to China, which is what China uses for their wind energy uh, mapping. Wind mapping, we developed that in Canada. And um, through our bilateral cooperation, we shared that with, uh, with China, and China's used it. So that's kind of our, our, um, our uh, West and our uh, nanoscope, which is, um, you know, in, in our world, we work with everybody. So it's a very close family. No one does anything on their own anymore. Even models are a mosaic of a lot of effort from around the world. They're not individual processes. So um, I might skip this one and just uh, finish with this, which is that um, when, when you look at, uh, and this came from uh, uh, Irina, that you know, two thirds of the investment in, in developing country is in clean energy solutions. Um, hydro, wind, solar, and marine have significant sensitivity to climate variability and change which means that that's why that period of understanding from weeks to, uh, to tens of years is an important cycle for, for filling that gap and we have a very strong initiative in that direction. And I, I think our decade for sustainable energy for all is gonna show how some of that new technology for those countries that are gonna show benefits for the developing world. With that I'll conclude, thank you very much. But I know David is actually going to be uh, in the panel session yeah. on uh, Thursday, and we look forward to your contribution to that okay. panel as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.